What's up, everybody? Emily Duplass is here from Rental Rookie. I am jumping in here live for our first day of this five-day challenge that's totally focused on um, analyzing rental property for cash flow. So I'm excited to be here with you today. I'm actually jumping in a little bit earlier than I will be throughout the rest of the week. Um, I'm going to flip my screen around. I'm actually sitting at the airport in Denver right now. Um, if you tuned into the, saw any of the videos I did this weekend, I was with my family and my extended family for a weekend in Breckenridge, and so we're actually flying home late tonight. Um, but I didn't want to postpone this video because I'm super excited to get started with you. So just so you know, um, I took that poll last night of when um, it's going to be best for most of you for me to be able to jump into the live trainings, and it's going to be probably between 8 and 9 o'clock for the rest of the week. Um, so you can be kind of shooting for that. I'll make sure to post um, as the week goes on during the day what time I'll be jumping on. Today's just a little bit earlier because I will actually be on a flight um, between 8 and 9 o'clock tonight. So I'm excited to jump in today because today's ch um, challenge topic is all about understanding investing lingo. So I think it's really important for you to realize that when you get started as a newbie in investing in rental property, there are so many terms that people throw around, um, especially you know seasoned investors or if you're reading books or even watching TV shows. And they're throwing all of these, these terms and acronyms like NOI and GOI and ROI and all of those terms. I know when I got started a couple of years ago, I had no idea, um, <laughs> you know, no idea at all what any of those terms meant. And so I know it can be super confusing because if you don't understand those terms and you, you kind of start to feel like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be doing this or I'm never going to learn all of these terms. So today is going to be really all about um, breaking down some of those terms. So as you guys are popping in, I know we have a couple of people live in here. Um, definitely, you know, I'd love for you to post questions that you have in the comment box as this goes on. Um, you know, let us know where you're from since this is the first training. I'm excited to be here with all of you. But as I go through this training, just make sure that you're throwing questions into the comments. And um, if I don't get to them all today just because of... Um, traveling, then I will at least answer them in comment form um, on the post tonight. So make sure whether you're tuning in live or if you're watching this in, you know, not in real time, throw in any questions that you have and I'll be sure to get back to you um, before tomorrow night's live training. So let's jump in and talk about some of the terms that can be most challenging um, and are some of the terms that are most important when it comes to investing in rental property. I'm just going to kind of put my phone down here for a second. All right. So one of the most important terms that it relates to buy and hold investors is is this idea of cash flow, right? This whole challenge is based on this idea of investing in rental property for cash flow. So when we're talking about cash flow, we're talking about that amount of money that is left over at the after all expenses are paid. So if you buy a rental property, and you know you your total expenses all in and this is everything it's mortgage it's utilities it's insurance it's everything let's say that your all in cost is $700 and you rent the property for $1000 then your cash flow your positive cash flow is going to be $300 a month and so you know if you're getting into buy and hold investing most a lot of people that get into this niche are going for that positive cash flow that passive income each month so when we're talking about cash flow we're talking about that net cash after all expenses are paid. So this week in the challenge, we are going to be, as the week goes on, kind of analyzing deals. And I'm going to show you how to analyze deals and run numbers so that you can really focus on that cash flow. Because that's what a lot of people who are out there who get started in this are going for. And I know that that's Kirk and I's bread and butter. That's what we go for whenever we're looking at a property. Some more terms that are super important. P-I-T-I. -I. You'll hear people throw this around if you've never bought a property at all. You probably might not know what this is, but this is referring to um, your principal, your interest, your taxes, and your insurance. So this is, you know, if you're taking out a loan from a bank, all right, this is where you're going to run into this P-I. So it's going to be the principal payment that you're paying down on that loan every month. It's going to be your interest based off of your interest rate, the taxes that are escrowed, and your insurance. And that's taxes and insurance are broken down into 12-month um, installments, right? Typically, those can be escrowed. Um, but whenever you hear that P-I-T-I, -I, that's what we're, we're referring to, your principal interest, taxes, and insurance. So that's going to be kind of your base payment of a property. Now, on top of that, depending on the type of property that you buy, you might have other expenses. You might have utilities. You might have property management. And there's going to be other expenses. It's going to go above and beyond just that P-I-T-I. -I. So if that's making sense to you, you know, definitely like things, um, throw in, you know, a, a thumbs up if you're understanding as I'm going along here. 
All right, GOI. GOI is related to this idea of the gross operating income. And so when we're talking about gross operating income, we're talking about taking the total amount of rent a property will generate within a year, right? So if we go back to that $1,000 example that I gave you, right? So if you are going to get $1,000 a month for 12 months, so this is your gross, so you're not taking any expenses out yet, then if you're getting $1,000 a month from a property, then your you know total gross income that you're going to make over the course of the year is $12,000. Then what you're going to do to get this gross operating income or the GOI is you're going to subtract out the vacancy rate losses and that's going to yield your GOI, right? So we're talking about this idea of vacancy rate, which I'm going to get to, which I guess I could talk about right now. Um, when we're talking about vacancy rate, we're talking about um, a percentage that you tend to or that we as when we analyze, we calculate into our analysis because the reality is we kind of have to assume that we might go one month or maybe even more throughout the course of a year and a lot of people will do a 12-month lease um, where the property is going to be vacant. And so you want to account for that in your analysis because it's going to give you a more accurate um, ROI whenever you're looking at your return on investment. So, you know, you can find that out by talking to a local realtor. Um, you know, we're really big about finding investor-friendly agents to kind of help you get started. Um, they can typically tell you what a, um, a vacancy rate is for your area. Um, it probably will depend on the type of area, the type of property that you're looking at. If you're looking at uh, maybe a more high-end property, um, it might not have as much turnover, whereas if you're looking at a property that maybe is a little more low income, you might have a little bit more turnaround when it comes to the types of tenants that are coming in and coming and going. Or even if you live in a transient area. We used to live in Northern Virginia outside of D.C., and it was a very transient area. People are coming and going and coming and going, so you kind of have to really account for that vacancy rate. On average, a lot of people will say to kind of throw in like a 10% vacancy rate. I know when Kirk and I run our analysis, we'll usually just take like a month's rent, right? And so, okay, let's assume that um, our property is not going to be rented for a month. So once we know what kind of our total expenses are for the property every single month, then we'll just calculate or we'll throw in, you know, one month's total expenses. Um, and we'll do it that way instead of doing a percentage. So there's different ways that you can go about doing it, uh, but definitely something if you want an accurate right, analysis. Sorry, if you hear <laughs> the announcement here at the airport, I apologize. That probably will happen a couple of times throughout this, um, throughout this training. Um, but definitely something if you want to run an accurate analysis is something that you need to account for is that vacancy rate. Um, all right, let's talk about net operating income. So we just talked about gross operating income. Now let's switch gears and talk about net operating income. So this is where you're going to talk about the income that's generated from the property, and you're going to subtract all of the expenses. So where gross operating income, we took that total gross amount of rent that you calculated, and we subtracted out that vacancy rate. Now we're subtracting all of the expenses. And so, you know, let's say that you have a gross operating income of, you know, $11,970, right? And you subtract out $6,000 because that's going to be your total expenses throughout the course of the year, you're left with $5,970 as your net operating income. And so this is going to tell you what you have left um, to work with here throughout the course of the year. So your net operating income is going to be less all of your expenses. So that's different than your GOI. So again, if you have questions throughout this live training, we have another person jumping in here. Um, feel free to throw those questions into the comment section um, and I will get to them if not live here depending on, on the flight, um, I will definitely get to them before tomorrow's live training. All right, ROI, one of the most important three letters that you're going to need to know when it comes to investing in rental property. Um, and here we're talking about your return on investment. And so this figure is calculated so that you know the percentage of your return on the money that you're going to invest. Sorry, my daughter's just running back over here. Um, in real estate, we calculate this by taking the total net income that you make in a year and you divide it by the total cash that you invested in the property. So let's say, for example, um, that you invested $15,000 into a property. That was, let's say, your down payment, your closing costs. You know, when you got the property rented with that first tenant, um, you had put in $15,000. Um, okay, so let's say that you are making about $450 a month. So you would take that $450 a month, you would times that by 12, and that would give you $5,400. You would divide that $5,400 by 15000 and that's going to give you your ROI. So in this example, that would have been a 36% ROI, right? 
This is so incredibly important when it comes to analyzing rental property because your ROI is going to be your line in the sand. This is something that you have to decide way early. What is going to be kind of your baseline? What are you shooting for? You know, when we invest in the stock market and things like that, we're looking at maybe like an 8 to 10% return. There are opportunities for you to get a higher ROI when you invest in rental property, and that's why a lot of people will invest in it. You know, Kirk and I shoot for 18 20% ROI, and most of our properties if not all of them, are making at least an 18% ROI. And so, you know, you kind of have to have a line in the sand where you say, all right, I'm going to run, I'm going to look to buy first, my first property. And when I run the numbers, and after this week, you're going to know how to run the numbers and how to analyze a property. And if that property does not meet a 15% ROI, I'm not going to waste my time looking any more into it. I'm not going to waste my time going to see it, right? But this can kind of be your test. If you run the numbers and the property you know, is yielding on paper a 15% ROI or more, then you might say, okay, now I might make a phone call or now I'm going to go view the property. But it's going to be a way to weed out the properties that you want to go after and the properties that you don't want to go after. So this learning how to calculate that ROI is super, super important. So again, it's taking that total net income that you make throughout the course of the year, less all of the expenses and mortgage payments and all of those things, divided by the total cash invested in the property, and that's going to give you that percentage that ROI percentage. So if that makes sense, definitely, you know, give me a like so that I know because that's so incredibly important that you understand that. Another super important term that you're going to learn is or hear about is CAPEX, which basically stands for capital expenditures. And these are the expenses. All right, good. I got some likes in there. I'm glad that that's making sense. If not, if you have questions about that, make sure that you throw them into the comment section. Back to CapEx. Um, these are those big ticket items. And so when you run an analysis, um, you have to make sure that you include in there the fact that most likely in a certain period of time, depending on how long you're planning on owning the property, you might have to replace an HVAC system or you might have to replace the roof or you're going to have to um, reside the property or you're, you're going to need a hot, new hot water heater, right? So these are all those super big ticket items that if you don't save up for those could really break the bank. Um, and if you don't have these cash reserves that you need could leave you kind of high and dry without cash. And so one of the things that you want to include when you run a really thorough analysis, um, sometimes when Kirk and I kind of run our quick and dirty, like just let's throw in some raw numbers quickly, um, then we don't necessarily calculate CapEx, but then once kind of we get that, okay, this, this meets our ROI goal, we're going to look into it a little bit more, we're going to run a more detailed property analysis, then we'll start to throw in things like CapEx. Um, but again, these are things, plumbing systems, electrical. Um, if you save a little bit of money each month, then whenever one of those big things goes wrong, then you have some money saved and you're not maybe having to take all of this profit that you've made off of a property and now dive that in and throw that into whatever this big ticket item is. So when we talk about CapEx expenses, we're talking about those big ticket items that you should be saving for um, throughout the course of the year, taking a little bit of money off of your profit to do that. Another tip that I'll just kind of throw in here when it comes to CapEx, Kirk and I don't really save a ton of money when it comes to CapEx um, because we get home warranties. And so, um, you know, this is something that depending on how long you've been listening to Kirk and I, whether it's on the podcast or in our, you know, free courses or things like that, um, we talk a lot about the how we've used home warranties um, where you pay, you know, a yearly fee for that. And Anytime some of these big ticket items go wrong, um, you know, you make a you make a call, you pay a, a seventy-five dollar, eighty dollar trade coffee, and they go and they check it out. And if there's something wrong with these big ticket items, they'll fix them. Kirk and I, in one of our properties a couple of years ago, um, we had an issue and we called and paid eighty dollars. And the home warranty guy came in, or the contractor came in, and we got a like a sixty-five hundred dollar HVAC system. Um, for what, like 80 bucks? Or I think we had to pay for like the cement they had to put down underneath the HVAC system. So I think it ended up costing us like $150 for like a $6,500 big ticket item. And so just a little side note here, um, when it comes to owning rental property, definitely look into a home warranty because I know that has saved Kirk and I big time. Property we didn't have one, a home warranty on, we had to replace the HVAC system and it cost us money. So, you know, we were kicking ourselves when that came down. We were like, oh, we should have kept our home warranty on that because it ends up saving you a lot of money. So CapEx, we're talking about those big ticket items. Sylvia, you asked, or you said about ROI. 
before I go on to the next one, you asked if the ROI is the most important number to figure. Um, Kirk and I really put a lot of weight on ROI um, because I think it really depends on what your goal is as an investor. You know, if your goal is to get in here and to be making a certain, you know, making some money each month, then you really have to make sure that you are kind of solid in what you're looking for as a return on investment. Because what you don't want to be doing is, is you know, throwing $25,000 into a property that's only going to yield you $100 a month in return, right? That's not a good investment because if you run the numbers, that's going to be a super low. It's probably going to be like a five to eight, maybe even less than 5% ROI. So, you know, you have to really kind of look at the big financial picture of this idea of ROI. What are you looking for in terms of a return? And you want to make sure that, you know, the type of the money that you're putting into the property is going to yield you the right amount of cash. You know, when we, Kirk and I got, to, got started investing in rental property years ago, I had no idea what an ROI was. And I used to argue with him because I, I, he'd be like, oh, we could get this property. You know, it's going to yield us $400 or $500 a month. And I'd be like, yeah, but we're putting 20000 into it. That doesn't make any sense. Why would we do that? And then I learned this idea of ROI and how you have to look at what it brings in versus what you put down and the percentage idea of it, and it starts to make that, that much more sense. So you have to kind of look past that idea of just that like idea of, oh my gosh, I'm going to put $20,000 in and it's only going to give me 400 a month. But when you look at this idea of investment, right, you're investing. So that's going to give you a much better ROI or a yield than maybe a stock market, a stock would, right, or a mutual fund. So you have to really think about that. Um, all right, let's go ahead and keep moving forward. Again, if you have questions, Sylvia, thanks for throwing that into the, po into the um, comment section. I'm glad you love the podcast. That's great. Um, yeah, uh, before I move on, Sylvia, great question. You said you asked me 15% or you don't even look. Pretty much, yeah. If it's under 15%, Kirk and I will not even, you know, waste our time. But you know what? We know plenty of investors who look for, you know, their ROI number is around 10 to 12% or 12 to 14%. So you really have to kind of look at your financial picture um, and really look at what your financial goals are um, and maybe where you currently have investments and what those investments are yielding you to give you kind of an idea of what you're really looking for. But yeah, if it's pretty much under 15%, um, um, Kirk and I won't go after it. And, you know, that in, I don't know, maybe in a good way or a bad way has allowed us to grow slowly. Um, you know, we're not looking to just throw like a ton of money into, you know, wastefully into properties. Like we have our guidelines. We have kind of our rules that we go by. And if that means we don't find a property for a couple of months, then we're okay with that because we want to make sure that we're making good, solid investments. We're not just trying to, you know, get emotional about it and be buying anything under the sun. So yeah, we're 50% is pretty much our, our hard one. All right, property management. You're going to hear about this. Probably pretty self-explanatory, but this is this idea that when you buy a rental property, right, you get you are in charge of kind of getting to closing. You sign on the dotted line. It's your property. This is where you hand it over to somebody else to take care of. So if you're not interested in self-managing your property, um, which is totally up to you to, to to decide to do, you can hand it off to a property management company, um, and they will then basically take care of everything. In most cases, property managers will get your property rented. They'll do showings. They'll collect checks. Um, they'll get the 3 a.m. phone calls if there are any. They'll do the tenant screening. They'll do all of those things. And so if you're not interested in, in having to deal with any of that, you can hand that off and you'll pay a certain amount. Um, an average, it depends on the area. You're looking at maybe 10%. Um, if you're looking at more into vacation rentals, that might be up to 12 to 15%. Um, definitely, it's, it differs in depending on where you are and the type of property. So definitely you would want to call around and get a quote for it. Um, but one of the things that you're going to want to think about if this is, you know, buying your first property, which I assume a lot of you are, that are tuning into this are, um, when you're running that first, those property analysis, if your plan is to eventually unload these properties off to a self-manager, maybe not the first one, you know, maybe you want to self-manage the first one. Maybe you want to self-manage the first couple, right? It's really important that you also include, find out what that average is, or even just throw in 10% as an average, um, and start calculating that into an analysis. Because the last thing that you want to do is buy a property um, and then find out, you know, a year or two down the road when you're ready to unload it and have a, a, a property manager take it over, that now your numbers don't work if you pay 10% to a property manager. So if you start off dealing with that and if you start off including that in your analysis, it's only going to help you kind of buffer yourself. That way if there does come a time that you want to unload it to a property manager, um, then you can. So definitely think about that when you're running that analysis to begin with. All right, again, as people are coming in, make sure that you throw questions into the comment section. If you're understanding what I'm talking about, give me some thumbs up because then I know for sure if you don't ask a question because I'm definitely here to um, hear for you. 
All right, if you are looking to house hack, so this is another term that you might hear, and I'm talking about PMI, or I think it's also referred to, some people refer to it as LPMI, but I'm talking about private mortgage insurance. So if you're planning to house hack, which means that you're planning to buy a property and live in it, and then either turn it into a rental eventually, or buy a multi-unit like a duplex and live in one side and rent out the other side, which a lot of rookie um, investors choose to go down that path, because you are able to um, get a property for a low down payment, which is huge when you're just getting started especially if you don't have a ton of cash. Um, what you will probably end up having to do is pay private mortgage insurance. So you're going to pay this whenever um, you know, you're putting down 35 to 5% if you're getting an FHA loan um, because you're not putting down a higher amount. It's basically like insurance for a bank, right? So when you put down on a conventional loan, um, which is typically the loan that people will use whenever they're buying a property as an investment, you have to put down 20%, typically at least 20%, unless it's a certain special lending company. Um, lending product. Um, and once you put down 20%, you don't have to pay that private mortgage insurance because you're putting down such a high down payment. Um, but when you put down that low down payment, it's basically like this insurance to the bank that if you are, you know, they're collecting this in case you default on your loan. And so that's another calculation or another number that you're going to want to include if you're planning to go down that house hacking route. If you're going to buy a, an investment property outright as a um, pure investment property, then you're going to have to put down 20% um, if you are using a financing institution. And so you're not going to have to worry about that. But if you are planning to house hack it, definitely something that you're going to want to think about is this private mortgage insurance. It's going to be something that you're going to have to include in your total expense. All right, multi-unit. If you are looking to get started in investing in rental property, well, when you hear somebody talk about the term multi-unit, this is typically talking about a property that is more than one unit, right? So we're not talking about a single family home or a townhouse or a condo. We're talking about duplexes, triplexes, you know, fourplexes or higher, right? When you Typically when you get to four or five or more, then you're starting to go into the commercial aspect of investing. But if you're, you know, most people who are just getting started tend to maybe want to look in either the single units or maybe the duplex or triplexes. So when you hear people refer to multi-unit, that's what they're talking about. All right, reserves. This is another big thing that if you're getting started in investing in rental property is really, really big so that you um, aren't getting six months into it and needing cash for some reason. You know, that HVAC system breaks and you didn't account for CapEx and you don't have a home warranty and now you've got to pay $6,500 to get it replaced. Um, cash reserves is the money that you have saved that can be used for problems and maintenance on your property. And so if you're planning to obtain a loan from a bank, right? So if you are going to go and try to get a conventional loan, the bank is going to want to see that you have at least six months of reserve um, of liquid funds that you can put toward, you know, whatever kind of problems arise. So in most cases, if you're going to a financing institution um, and looking to get that conventional loan, if you don't have six months of reserves and some sort of liquidity, like a, a way that you can get to it liquid, then you are probably not going to be able to, you know, get approved for that loan. So if it's definitely, you know, if you're looking six, eight, ten months out from now and buying that first rental property, um, you're going to want to make sure that you are also kind of saving for that reserve, which I know, you know, as you're getting started, it can be really intimidating because you're like, are you kidding? I'm trying to save all this money for a down payment. And now I have to save all this money for the reserves. Um, and really, I mean, it's really only protecting you. So if you can forget about the bank for a minute and yeah, all the banks making me do this, but really it's only protecting you because the last thing that you want to do is liquidate your entire savings account or your 401k or whatever you're going to use as an IRA to buy this rental property and then something go bad and then you have no money to pay for it, right? And then you're, you know, pulling out credit cards and going into more debt and bad debt for that matter. And so if you're looking to go that financing route, um, definitely something that you're going to want to think about and start planning for is those six months reserves. So um, definitely think about that as well. All right, another big one that is just getting started. And I know, you know, I'm going to take a quick moment to take a time out. I know I'm kind of talking at you the rest of the week. I don't plan on just kind of talking at you throughout the entire training. Um, but because of the circumstances of me sitting in an airport, there isn't much more that I can do. So I'm hoping that, you know, in me being able to explain some of these terms to you, that it'll make sense. And like I said earlier in the, um, in the video, if you have questions, even if you're not on here live, if you're watching this later tonight or tomorrow, throw those questions in there and I will make sure to get in and answer those for you. All right. So seller financing, this is one ticket or one idea for you to get creative. So, um, if you are looking to kind of stay away from the banks, right, you maybe don't have the greatest credit 
credit score. You don't have 20% to be able to put down. Um, this idea of seller financing might be an option for you. So this is the case where basically the seller becomes the bank and you're going to negotiate terms with the seller, not the bank, right? So technically the seller is going to hold the note, so to say, on the property um, and you are going to be paying them. So they're basically the bank. So you'll negotiate the interest rate. You're going to negotiate the loan terms. You're going to negotiate the down payment right? And it's basically just a void. A, you're still kind of taking, I don't want to say you're taking out a loan, but you're, you're going to go through kind of the same process in that aspect. You're still going to, you know, have a principal pay down that you're going to do. You're going to pay some interest. Um, you're still going to have, that will include most likely kind of the taxes and insurance. Um, but it's just a way to avoid the banks if you're having any trouble getting qualifying, right? So a lot of people out there who are like, I don't have a great credit score or I don't have 20% to be able to put down Definitely, you know, if you find a property that you're interested in, always ask, hey, is the seller interested in seller financing, right? Especially if it's a, um, especially if it's a rental property already, um, maybe that, maybe that um, landlord wants to continue getting that monthly, you know, that monthly income. And so they might be open to it, but you'll never know unless you ask. So if you're interested in that, definitely something you should look into is this idea of seller financing. Um, all right. I'm trying to think if there's any more major, major terms that I need to talk about today. Oh, depreciation. That was another big one that I wanted to talk about. Um, before we wrap up for today. And depreciation is something that's going to be calculated when you run a, one of those thorough property analysis, right? So like I had mentioned earlier, Kirk and I tend to run kind of quick and dirty ones um, to get started. And I'll show you what I'm talking about later on this week and another day that we're doing training. Um, but we, you know, try to do a quick and dirty raw one, all right? What do the basic numbers look like? Is it something we want to pursue or not? Then we jump into that more deep analysis, which I'll be showing you also later on this week. And that's where then you start to calculate things like, you know, the more your tax rate and the, the mortgage interest write-off that you get to do and this the whole idea of depreciation, right? So this idea of depreciation is basically the, the, devalu the devaluing of an asset. So every year, right, that, that a property goes on or ages, right, it kind of, there's this idea that it then is becoming devalued. And so in real estate terms, we're talking about as, as properties age, the conditions typically remain stagnant. Um, and so that in that case, the property, the value of the property can go down. So when you run a pretty, a, a thorough property analysis, typically this is, depreciation is calculated at about 27 and a half percent. Uh, or 27 and a half years. And so that is something that is kind of calculated in. And, and I'm going to just touch on it this week or today, and I'm going to jump into it a little bit more deep later in the week uh, because I think it's better to see than it is for me to be talking about. But that's another term that you're going to want to be thinking about when you're running a more thorough property analysis. So, so those are some of the major, major terms that you're going to want to become familiar with whenever you're getting started in investing in rental property. Um, be on the lookout in your email because I have an email that's going to be coming out to you. It's going to have um, the link to this video so that you can watch it again. Or um, it will also be, we have a, a, like basically a library page for you where you're going to be able to access all the videos throughout the week and you're going to be able to access all the downloads that we have. In the email, there will also be a download, your worksheets for this video and this training, which basically are going to break down the terms that I went over to, to uh, with, over with you today plus examples. So definitely check your email, be on the lookout for that. If you happen to find your way into this Facebook group without signing up for the challenge per se on the rentalrookie.com slash challenge page, definitely head over there and do that because that's the only way that you're going to be able to get the emails. Otherwise, you're just going to be getting the live trainings here. Um, I hope this was helpful. Like I said, I'm going to be jumping on every night between eight and nine this week because most of you said that that's what's best for you. Um, please, I know that since I was on a little bit early today, a lot of you are probably still at work. I get it. Um, so definitely throw questions in so that I can get in and I can comment on those and get those questions answered. Um, if, and those of you who are here and who are listening and joining right now, if you have any other questions, throw those in and I can comment on those quickly before I go. Um, if not, be on the lookout for your email. It will be coming and tomorrow I'm excited. We will be jumping into another hot topic when it comes to analyzing rental property for cash flow. So as the week goes on, it's going to start getting a little bit more detailed, a little bit more focused and toward the middle of the end of the week, we're going to actually be running numbers and I'll be showing you, you won't be looking at me, you'll be looking at properties and, and analysis spreadsheets, and we'll be doing that later in the week. So stay tuned. Um, I'm excited to be here with you, um, and I guess I will be getting on my flight soon. So questions that you have, throw them in the comment section, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow.